we are recording. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to National Engineering Month's Get to Know Deep River Nuclear. Today we're gonna to be talking about the past, the present and the future. This presentation is brought to you by National Engineering Month. Hopefully you've also had an opportunity to check out some of the other presentations this month and also from the Professional Engineers of Ontario, also known as the PEO. A little bit more about the PEO. We are a, oops, we are a fairly large region here out in the Algonquin chapter. The Algonquin chapter is just one of many chapters across Ontario. And Deep River is just about right here, if you can see that, located near the Chalk River Laboratories. The PEO's legislated mandate is to regulate the practice of professional engineering and govern the individuals and organizations that are licensed in order that the public interest may be served and protected. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a lot of really cool things that have happened in the past, the present, and the future. Keep in mind the role that engineers play in all these things and the public interest and how it's served and protected. In the Algonquin chapter, we have about 400 registered professional engineers. That doesn't include the engineers in training that we also have in the chapter. So who are we more specifically? Um, I just, I don't know if you guys can see this little toolbar. I'll try to make that go away. Uh, let's see. Boom, hopefully that works. Okay, so today we have here with the Algonquin chapter, our present chair, Bob Renovochki, PNG, our PO Algonquin past chair, Judith Senaranti, Herbert Mueller, our PNG board member, and myself as a communications officer. We also have special guests for the Q&A panel, the president and board chair, Michael Stevens of the Society for the Preservation of Canada's Nuclear Heritage. That is the Deep River Nuclear Museum and Phil Compass, Canadian Nuclear Laboratory Corporate Communications Manager. If you guys have any specific questions today about the museum and CNL laboratories, these guys will be here to help us. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Bob, our current Algonquin chair. Bob, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and today's video? Thanks, Sabra, for this nice introduction. My name is Bob Radenovic. I was born and raised in Bosnia and Herzegovina, former Yugoslavia. I have more than 30 years of experience in manufacturing, automotive, and nuclear industry. And really, I enjoyed especially working the last years as a part of P.O. Algonquin chapter. He, there, I met a lot of interesting people, a lot of way to communicate, share the ideas, and make interesting things like it's this event. What I would like to tell in my whole life, I really enjoyed the most my last 10 years working in Canadian Nuclear Lab where I was able to get a lot more meeting, a lot more interesting people work on a lot of interesting ideas and why it's really nice to work in this uh, uh, company, you can see in this video. Thanks a lot. Hey, my name's Carrie. I work with Canadian Nuclear Laboratories as a Talent Solutions Advisor. CNL is Canada's largest national nuclear laboratory, and we have a robust work environment which offers a wide range of career opportunities, as you can imagine. Our careers ranging from nuclear physicists to skilled trades such as electricians, millwrights, plumbers, instrumentation and control, and HVAC, to name a few. We have veterinarians, vet techs, engineering and technical staff, utility workers who maintain our roads and grounds, fire and security who ensure the safety of our people, our facilities, and the environment. We offer a wide range of innovative careers. We have a number of high-level priorities at CNL, which include cleaning up the environment, creating clean energy for today and tomorrow, and improving the health of Canadians. 
If you strive for excellence, have a high accountability, and want to be a part of the solutions to a number of the world's biggest challenges, we've got a career for you. Do you want to build a career within your field, or are you interested in branching out into new opportunities and challenges? We are always looking to advance employees as a way to build a strong, dedicated, and knowledgeable workforce. Success is in our people, and staff at CNL come from diverse backgrounds with vastly different skill sets. The most common characteristic for advancing at CNL is a drive for excellence and a willingness to learn. Are you passionate and motivated by continuously learning more and willing to broaden your skill set? CNL can open up so many options to grow your career. So I may be a bit biased, as I am fortunate to work for a company that continues to be a leader in the Canadian nuclear industry, empowering a highly skilled workforce that continues to grow and provide me with a challenging and rewarding career. Not only is CNL a great place to work, as it has so much to offer, we continue to create new and innovative work in almost any career path you can think of, with a unique and diverse workforce, with minds from all over the world, our campus is a place bursting with opportunities for scientific discovery, for careers, for new challenges and new skills. The best part for me is living and working in the Renfrew County. Living in a quiet, friendly community with no shortage of places to go and exciting things to do as a family. While having the opportunity to be a part of world-class science and technology. Not only is the area a wonderful place to raise a family, it also offers a lifestyle as the Ottawa River is at your doorstep provincial parks less than an hour away, farmers markets and festivals in the summer, and endless amounts of winter activities with the nation's capital only a short drive away. What more could you need in the place that you live, work and play? Visit us at cnl.ca. <coughs>
It has to, not only to protect the environment, but to protect our way of life. To build a clean energy future here in Canada, we have to pursue scientific progress today. Science to develop energy that is free of greenhouse gases. Science to protect our environment from pollutants and other harmful emissions. And science to make clean energy technologies work better together. From nuclear energy and hydrogen to solar and wind power. We've harnessed nuclear science to change the way Canadians power their lives. And we're poised to do it again by bringing the next generation of nuclear reactors to Canada. Small modular reactors. SMRs will challenge your assumptions about nuclear power. They are safe, more efficient, and more flexible than the reactors of the past. And they make more than electricity. Heat for your homes and businesses. Steam for industrial processes and clean, reliable power in places that need it. Companies from around the world are coming to Canadian nuclear laboratories to bring these technologies to life. The stage is set. And what better place than the White Shell or Chalk River Laboratories, the birthplace of nuclear energy in this country? Whether it's SMRs, hydrogen vehicles, or advanced fuel technologies, CNL is solving some of the world's most challenging problems in clean energy. To build a brighter, cleaner, sustainable future for all Canadians. All right, thank you for that introduction, Yuditha. So we've talked a lot about the future. We've talked about future opportunities, and now we're looking really far in the future with uh, SMRs. So let's jump to kind of the, oops. The, oops, sorry about that. Just try to view, present. Here we go. Um, now let's jump over to Herbert's video. This is about, um, I'm sorry, guys. This one is about nuclear border security. This is a little bit more about the present. Herbert, can you tell us about yourself and about your video and how it relates to engineering? Yeah, thanks, Ebra. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining in tonight. Um, my name is Herbert Mueller. I am an electrical engineer. Uh, I've been practicing about just about 15 years uh, in the industry, mostly in the uh, power generation industry. I uh, recently moved from actually in in, I guess, the oil and gas country down in Alberta, uh, where I pretty much cut my teeth in, in electrical engineering and uh, in the uh, oil and gas industry. And then I moved into hydro and kind of further to what Uditha was saying about, you know, clean energy and, and uh, different options for how, how we can kind of, you know, enjoy the lifestyles that we have. I thought hydro was a great choice, but, but very quickly, uh, the, the need to kind of expand on that, um, to, you know, nuclear would definitely seem like an option. So I, I kind of got into, uh, you know, I started seeing that about four years ago that nuclear engineering was a way to go. And, and, uh, and uh, we, we moved to, from Alberta to, to Ontario and joined the nuclear labs in, in uh, 2019. Um, this video on uh, nuclear border security actually captures what's always been, you know, uh, fa fairly important to me about what, what uh, sometimes you don't learn in engineering. Um, engineering is, is often thought of as, as, uh, as purely a, a technical um, profession, uh, but, but it always strikes me that, that if, if big systems didn't fail, then the profession would not look the way it does today. Uh, so many of the regulatory uh, frameworks and, and, the, and the rules and, and uh, the structures behind engineering is, is definitely uh, around safety. And so so really about health, safety, and security are, are actually some of the things that, that, that really a uh, practicing engineer needs to think about. And uh, so this, this, uh, this video is about, uh, it's actually a really good example of how uh, creative engineering can come together to kind of uh, um, 
you know, merge all, all three of those together. And this is uh, on uh, muon uh, tomography imaging. And uh, maybe I'll pose a little bit of a challenge to the audience out there and, uh, you know, be curious to know if anybody could comment on the health, safety and security aspects that this, this uh, technology presents and how that might relate to engineering. Thanks very much. There are about 3 million cargo containers going through Canada's ports each year. So ensuring that there's no hidden or illegal materials inside these containers can be a pretty big job. Luckily, detecting nuclear materials hidden inside these containers is about to get a whole lot easier. Cargo containers are big metal boxes that are about 53 feet long and they can be filled with anything. And there's so many of these things coming through uh, ports of entry into and out of the country every day, every hour, every minute, that it's impossible to look inside every single one of them. At Chalk River Laboratories, Andrew's team is working with a technology that will be able to detect hidden nuclear materials inside cargo containers coming across the border. This technology is called muon tomography. The sun's turbulent surface and other objects in space like supernova are constantly spitting out material which hits the Earth's atmosphere creating particles called muons. Since you started watching this video, thousands of muons have been passing straight through you. In fact, muons pass through most everyday materials. These muons can pass through a very large amount of very dense material. So they can pass kilometers into the Earth before they are stopped. The muon part explains the type of particles that we're using to actually do this and the tomography is the type of uh, image reconstruction that we're doing. This apparatus is called CRYPT, which stands for Cosmic Ray Inspection and Passive Tomography. It was created through an innovative partnership between many Canadian institutions to demonstrate the muon tomography technology. So what we've done is we've built uh, a two-story large detector which actually is able to track these muons as they enter and exit the detectors. When a muon hits a piece of cargo, it will pass right through in a straight line. Even if there are materials in the way, like say a person, this muon will still pass through in a straight line. If, however, a dense material like a lead casing is inside the cargo, the muon will be deflected. The detector will see a change in the direction and energy of the muon and know that something is up. Muon tomography imaging is very similar to an x-ray image you might see at airport security. Muons, however, are only stopped by the densest of materials, like for example, lead. Also unlike x-ray images, muons are constantly raining down on us from space, which means that no artificial radiation has to be created to get these images. So these particles are coming from essentially outer space and passing through all of our detectors right here and we're extracting so much information from them uh, and the only way we can really handle all this information is with what you see here, all these uh, lit up electronics boards which are constantly time stamping, filtering, coinciding different pieces of information and sending them to the computer over a local internet. This technology will be able to quickly and effectively find any dense containers that might be shielding nuclear materials passing through Canada's borders. The facilities at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories will allow the team to test their imaging techniques using nuclear materials as well as nuclear shielding on site. The goal is to have muon tomography detectors operating at borders across the country, benefiting all Canadians and keeping our borders secure. Awesome, thanks for that introduction, Herbert. So I have to say, as someone who's in the nuclear industry right now, it's a really exciting time. The technology, engineering, uh, especially SMRs, it's so exciting. Um, but we have to remember where we, we have to remember where we came from. And that's where the Canadian nuclear heritage comes in. That's where we talk a little bit about the past. So Michael Stevens is the president and chair of the Canadian Nuclear Society. Um, him and his son have directed and put together this amazing video that we're about to show you. And he's also here today um, to answer any questions that you might have. So put him in the chat. And without further ado, we're going to hit play. Index. Hello, my name is Michael Stevens. I'm the president of the Society for the Preservation of Canada's Nuclear Heritage. We're working to preserve 
and present the long story of Canada's involvement in nuclear science and technology. Some of that history is told in various small museums, but only part of it. We want to tell the whole story in both a virtual museum and a physical museum. I'd like to thank the professional engineers for this opportunity to present our effort to preserve Canada's past and also setting the stage for the future developments, which I'm sure engineers are going to be contributing for many decades to come. When people think about Canadian nuclear technology, typically the first thing they think about is the Canada reactor. Things Bruce Darlington that produce over half of Ontario's electricity routinely. Well, there's a long history to the development of those machines, and this chart to my right shows that history all the way from the beginning of nuclear energy development in Canada. The very first reactor was ZEEP, Zero Energy Experimental Pile. It didn't produce energy, but it was a pure research reactor used to develop the nuclear physics calculations for the first big research reactor, NRX, National Research Experimental. NRX was the world's most versatile and large-scale research reactor for many decades. And it was followed in 1957 by its sibling, NRU, National Research Universal. That reactor carried on for 60 years, and it was only shut down in 2018. NPD, the first CANDU demonstration reactor, 25 megawatts was built just up the valley from Chalk River and it led to the Douglas Point reactor down on the Bruce Peninsula, 220 megawatts. After that, the first multi-unit station, Pickering, was built, eight reactors starting in the 1970s and then that led to two streams of reactors, the 700 megawatt class which included single unit stations at Point Le Pro and Balsé, Gentilly 2, and Chernovoda 1. That reactor type was converted into multi unit stations at Chernovoda, at Wolsung in Korea, and Xinchan in China. In the 900 megawatt class, there were the Bruce A and Bruce B reactors, now the, great, the largest reactor complex in the world, and the Darlington reactors near Toronto. The plans for future development of the CANDU class was the ACR 700. We have a model of that, and who knows how things are going to develop in the future, but that would be a candidate for the next generation of reactors. Right, this is a model of an ACR 700. It was a proposed improvement on the single unit station, the kind used at Point Le Pro. Basically, it was an optimized design. It had a much smaller calandria, and it used slightly enriched uranium and light water coolant, but retained the heavy water moderator and on-line uh, refueling that Candus are famous for. This hasn't been developed yet, but it's still available if we want to pursue it in the future. As you can see in the model, it has a quite a dense interior to the Calandria, of course, since it is smaller than the existing uh, 700 megawatt class reactors. NPD, or Nuclear Power Demonstration, was the first true CANDU power reactor. It was built about 20 kilometers upriver from Chalk River Laboratories, and it showed a real innovation from the research reactors at Chalk River itself. Those reactors had fuel channels vertically, uh, and in NPD, the original design was going to be uh, a vertical fuel channel design as well. But it was decided later that given difficulties in producing pressure vessels for that style of reactor, it would make much more sense to have the fuel channels horizontal that also made it possible to uh, in, get into online refueling with fueling machines at either end of each fuel channel. 
And those were the defining characteristics that can-do reactors have had ever since. Now in our collection, we've got quite a range of items from NPD. For example, <clears throat> this photo shows the generator for the station. Um, this is a photo from when it was started up in 1962. And you can see the little builder's plates on, on the generator. Just down on the table here, we've got those two very plates straight off the machine. Of course, we had the fuel bundles that went into the fuel channels. This was the very first design, a later one, a 19 fuel pin bundle. And we've got in our collection the official engineer stamped drawing of that fuel channel. So that's a rarity. But in our collections, not only do we have the straight technical side, it's the human side of the story that we find interesting as well. So for example, oh, I'll hold up this very heavy coffee mug, and you will see that the shell of the mug is made out of calandria tube material, and the base is made out of pressure tube material. And this is typical of the kind of retirement gifts and celebratory items that were made for people along the way. We're interested in collecting that kind of interesting thing too. This is a model of the NRX reactor, the first big experimental reactor in Canada. It has vertical fuel channels, natural uranium in them, moderated by heavy water, as in later can do's. But it was cooled by light water running through tubes coming in from the top down to the bottom and out. It was a straight through cooling cycle to the Ottawa River. Around the outer part of the core was the so-called J-rod annulus, these rods here in the model. And that was where originally uh, plutonium was produced way back when in the, in the Cold War days. Later on, that array of rods was converted over to irradiate cobalt to make cancer therapy sources. Now you notice the fuel channels here are vertical. Candu reactors these days, they're horizontal. The big change came in the NPD reactor when it was decided for technical reasons it was better to have the fuel rods horizontal. Even though NRX and its sibling NRU could be refueled from on top, it was much easier to fuel from the two ends later on, and that became standard practice. Now we have many examples of different parts of reactors in our collection. Here's one of my favorites. It's called an NRX loop trip whistle. About a half a dozen of these cooling channels were isolated and then looped into external circuits so that you could run experiments in them at a different temperature and pressure than in the rest of the reactor. These loop trip whistles, one per loop, were air driven and they would give an indication if something was amiss and needed tending to. And yes, it actually works. I have pumped air through it and it makes a nice whistle. And each loop had its own distinctive whistle. They were tuned so you could tell which one was which. You also notice that this artifact and all the other ones in our collection has got a QR tag. That's got all the information we've got about uh, the origin, use, interesting facts about the individual artifact. So for our over 400, over 450 artifacts now, we have them all catalogued, studied, and labeled. Well, CANDU reactors are a key part of Canadian nuclear history. There are many, many other facets of nuclear technology where Canada has been heavily involved. One of them is accelerators. For example, we've had the Fela and Impella industrial accelerators at Chalk River and the I-1011 uh, electron accelerator out at White Shell in Manitoba. One of the most important scientific uh, accelerators we've had in Canada is TASC, 
TASC stands for Tandem Accelerator Superconducting Cyclotron. It was at Chalk River. It was uh, taken out of service in the mid-1990s, but in its day it was only one of four machines in the world capable of doing what it could do. The tandem accelerator part involved taking negatively charged ions, accelerating them up to the midpoint in the tandem accelerator, and then accelerating them again as positively charged particles. Then the beam could be directed through a superconducting cyclotron to accelerate them even more, and then sent off to the experimental area into various experimental rigs. One of the souvenirs we have from TASC is the chart that shows the safety levels. It, it tells you what's going on in the different parts of the whole system and what areas are safe as regards radiation and which areas aren't. So a choice sample. As well, TASC has inspired artwork. This diagram was one of the primary people involved in the project. Uh, the design of the uh, superconducting cyclotron is imposed over the main part of it. And as with all excellent projects that know what's important in life, we have the t-shirt from TASC. Besides scientific research and industrial applications, accelerators can produce some rather beautiful artwork. This figure in the lucite block you're seeing is called the Lichtenberg figure. It was produced with the electron accelerator at Wodschel Laboratories. Basically, the lucite is irradiated in the accelerator and then uh, tapped with a, a sharp object at one end outside. And the stresses induced in the lucite block by the irradiation are then released and you get this wave-like pattern throughout the lucite. Illuminate it and you've got a unique piece of art. Some of the objects in our collection are actually retirement gifts, which are interesting, of course, for nostalgia value, but sometimes as well, they're actually very interesting, technologically speaking. This is a table lamp given to Alan Lane on his retirement. He was heavily involved in the development of the Canflex Advanced Fuel Bundle. So his retirement gift was a half of a fuel bundle inside a pressure tube, inside a calandria tube, separated by a garter spring. Very nice reminder for him of his career. But also, that could be used to explain the insides of a CANDU reactor. The stream of research reactors in Canada did end with the NRU reactor. There was also the Slowpoke reactor. It was a small, ultra-safe reactor it was quite suitable for use in universities. We have got uh, in our collection the console from the Slowpoke reactor out at the University of Alberta in Calgary. They sent it to us. As far as we know, it's still in working order. And some days, if we can get a reduced scale model of a Slowpoke, we'll try and hook it up and have an actual working model. Besides collecting information on directly nuclear technology, we're interested in all the related things. For example, the little brown calculator in the middle there, it's called a Frieden calculator. We picked it up for a dollar in a garage sale in Deep River. Well, so what? Well, it's a pre predecessor, of course, of the electronic computers we use today. It's all electromechanical. The innards are just amazing. And on the side of this case, on this one, it says property of U.S. Navy. Now, why on earth would a U.S. Navy calculator end up here? Well, we did do tests in the NRX reactor for the U.S. Navy to develop the fuel that went into uh, American military uh, vessels, submarines, uh, aircraft carriers, etc. And in fact, that approach to reactor design ended up in the American PWR reactors that they used down south. So there's a direct connection to the United States. Off to the right, this impressive looking module with the big blue background 
is the Datatron uh, computer. It was the first electronic computer used at Chalk River Labs. It was based on vacuum tubes, not transistors. This was back in the 1950s. And it had all the data storage anyone could hope for. On the right of the display, on the side, is one of these storage modules. And this impressive array of tubes and resistors and such was capable of storing one whole byte. And the computer had about 155 of them. Glorious storage capacity. ZEEP, the Zero Energy Experimental Pile, the first Canadian reactor and the first reactor to go critical outside the United States. ZEEP went critical on September 5th, 1945, and last year the Society put out a commemorative stamp to celebrate the 75th anniversary of that. Those stamps are still available, by the way. And you can see just down below the stamp, there is a model of the ZEEP reactor. It's actually one of our many retirement gifts. It was given to Ralph Green upon his retirement. Down on the right of our display, which we've used to various exhibits, you can see three big gray blocks. Those are three of the actual graphite blocks used to build ZEEP and uh, they're still available. If you want to come over and heft one, good luck. They weigh about 100 pounds each. It's amazing how dense they are. In the middle of the little display of the three blocks, you'll see a little sign. It says, original heavy water gauge used in September 1945. And the text reads, on September 5th, 1945, when the heavy water reached to within a few millimeters of the predicted height, Dr. Lou Kowarski announced critical, and everyone clapped. The height was 132.6 centimeters. Unfortunately, we only have this label. The actual heavy water gauge has disappeared. And if any of you know where it is, we'd be delighted to have a chat. Besides our large collection of artifacts, and I've shown you a few examples, but there are many more, we also have a large collection of books limited to nuclear technology, mathematics and science and related topics. All of these books have been uh, labeled, cataloged, indexed, up to international library standards so that they're available to anyone interested in doing research on various topics in the nuclear area. One of the key people in Canadian nuclear history was Wilford Bennett Lewis. W.B. Lewis, who led the, the work at Chalk River for many years. We have many of his personal belongings and souvenirs. For example, the Enrico Fermi Award he received from Ronald Reagan, President of the United States. W.B. Lewis's personal dosimeter badge from Chalk River. He had badge number 11, if you're interested. His camera. He was an amateur photographer, and the radio. In World War II, he was involved in British radar research. And this is the radio he had here after the war. And he was the kind of guy who was unhappy with one of the six bands on the radio, complained to the manufacturer. They told him what was wrong, and he took a radio apart and fixed it himself. So quite the person and just one of many people that we've got interesting stories to tell about. Well, there's a brief introduction to the Society and what we're working towards. If you are interested in knowing more, you can go to our website, nuclearheritage.com. If you'd like to join us, there's a membership application there. If you have anything you think might be of interest to keep it in our National Museum to me, please let us know. And there's our story in a nutshell. I think it's time to say goodbye. I'd just like to take this opportunity again to thank PEO for giving us an opportunity to spread our message to a broader audience. Bye for now.
All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, I've personally spent quite a bit of time at the museum. It's awesome. Please check it out. And we're constantly receiving donations. This community out here is it's amazing. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Alex. Wonderful job on that. Really informative. We're going to go on to the um, to the Q&A section now. So I saw that there were some questions. Let's see. Um, All right, this question looks like it's for Bob. Bob, if someone's interested in getting more involved with the PEO, what advice do you have for them? Well, just come and contact us. We will invite you, introduce you a lot of interesting options, what to do, and we will really can help you to see all the interesting things could be done. For example, I'm just thinking maybe with my background in automotive industry, now working in nuclear industry, maybe created some nuclear powered car. So a lot of options. Feel free to come. Nothing is impossible when we join and work together. On the other side, we have a lot of opportunities to maybe create some interesting events. If you have any interesting ideas, we can also join you how to work with our regulator, with younger members, we can help them how to get their license. Whatever problem you have, please come to us. We will most likely as always find a way to resolve it. Wonderful, thanks Bob. Okay, I'm looking here, looks like we have another question. Um, okay, so you did the Bob Herbert, um, do you have any advice for an EIT that's soon to become an engineer in the nuclear industry? Um, so this is Udita. Uh, let me see whether I can take that. Any advice for an EIT who is hoping to become a PNG? My advice to you would be put some uh, effort into getting your experience record written up as quickly as possible because what I have experienced uh, with my work in the chapter is that many people get, uh, well, I shouldn't say many people, some people get quote unquote writer's block. They are nervous about writing up their experience thinking that PEO will reject it. Uh, my advice is get something together. There is lots of help available from various channels uh, that will allow you to have it reviewed, uh, give, get some advice uh, and then submit it so that you can get on the path to licensure very quickly. Um, that's the best piece of advice that I can give you. Yeah, I'd like to add a little bit to that. Uh, thanks, Yuditha. Um, for me personally, I, I, I always think that, uh, you know, we graduate uh, a, an engineering program and I think that Sometimes you, you talk to somebody who's really been in the game a long time and, and some would say that you're actually at the top of your technical game when you graduate. And uh, what happens when you start practicing is, is you start to, to realize what uh, the rest of the regulatory framework has, uh, um, what, what kind of role it plays. And, and I would recommend that uh, any new graduates or anybody who's um, just entering the field of engineering to, to get engaged with the, the professional regulator because, because the more you actually run your career, you find out that the, the regulatory aspect is, is essentially the soul of what engineering really is. Um, and, and, it, and it's very difficult to separate that from the technical proficiency side. And so I think it's something that the, the sooner that you get involved and, and to become aware of that side of things, then I think the, that will translate into a, a very rewarding career. Great advice, Herbert and Yuditha, thanks. It looks like we have a little bit of a follow-up question to that one. Um, are there any certifications or skills that would help someone stand out in the application process? Uh, it's Udita again, not really in my experience. Uh, PEO has a set of criteria and it is basically uh, getting a little bit uh, fuzzy here, there is engineering design, there is 
application of theory, there is uh, ethics, and there are some other other areas like that. I, I, I don't remember off the top of my head now. It's been a while. Uh, but, but as long as you uh, hit those areas in your experience record, uh, you, you have a pretty clear shot at licensure. It's, uh, it, it's, it's the experience that counts. You don't have to worry too much about standing out and so on and so forth. I mean, I mean it's nice to have some unique areas in your career uh, that makes for an interesting read, but uh, don't worry about that aspect. Uh, Bob, I will also follow up, for example, advice for that question is apply for our design engineering, which is here in Deep River. So just becoming part as mechanical engineer, we need this type profile and you will work on really on design, which will be a requirement to get your license and you will have it in a couple of years, depending, you know, how long of engineering experience you have. So the best advice is apply for job. Let's say one of the team could be design engineering or whatever else. And after that, everything will come. Yeah, there's a bit of a follow up to that as well. Just speaking from my time at CNL and uh, the way they are essentially trying to rebrand themselves, you know, from, from uh, you know, they're, they're going through a bit of a, you know, revitalization and that's uh, very public but uh, the the aspect of that we're, we're trying to build uh, engineering teams that uh, are collaborative and in an application if you highlight some of the you know in addition to you know your academic scholastic kind of achievements uh, to, to highlight some of the public service things that you might be doing and to demonstrate that that, that you're a good team player and you collaborate and you you work well with others and, and uh, you know, you're very pr proactive that way. So I think that would also help in an application as well. Yeah, those are great guys. I think I would just add, you know, leadership skills, um, speaking classes, you know, Toastmasters, there's local Toastmasters chapter, Dale Cargany classes. Those things are really great too. Um, okay, it looks like we have a question from Michael. Michael, what can we look forward to seeing come from the museum? Oh, Michael, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, at the moment, we have an application into the Canadian Museum of History to get a grant to work on this virtual museum I mentioned. Um, the idea is, uh, like many museums these days, uh, as well as having a bricks and mortar uh, museum, you also have something online where uh, people who just cannot make it to your neck of the woods um, can actually can actually um, have a look at your displays. Uh, for example, a good example is at, um, McGill University for Ernest Rutherford's work there. That's coming up in the next few months. Um, we would have been much more visible than we have been so far because COVID has really put a, a limit on uh, what we can do. Um, but still, we are happy to receive people in uh, come passing by through Deep River uh, by appointment uh, because we have to take COVID precautions for the moment. After that, um, we're hoping someday to be able to move to a more permanent uh, facility than we have now, what we have, we call an interim storage facility. It's fairly small. It's a 70 year old bit. Well, it was built back in the 1940s and we're already outgrowing it. Um, like all museums, we're running out of space. So we need to get more space and a, a more modern building. So hopefully in the not too distant future, if we can arrange uh, enough financial support, um, We'll, we'll go for that kind of uh, more substantial building. And as well, right now we're largely a volunteer effort. And in the longer term, to be sustainable, we'll have to get permanent staff who can be there on, on more than a, a voluntary basis. So that in general is our plans. What 
you can hope to see what we hope we'll be able to offer to you in the future. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. Looking forward to seeing what comes out of there. Um, Herbert, you did that. Did you guys have any questions that were sent privately to you? Uh, I do not. Not this time. Actually, I would like we also have Michael Sun here who have created the excellent video. Maybe he can give us maybe some insight how was to creating this really nice video. Is he muted? He was having trouble before. Oh, uh, we can unmute him. Sarah, can you unmute uh, Alex? Alex? Oh, suddenly, suddenly, and then there was Alex. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I, I didn't have the ability to unmute myself there, but uh, yeah, thank you, Bob, and uh, well, thanks everyone. And you know, it was. It seems quite a few months ago I was asked about this event and producing this video, and it was really exciting and. Uh, I think I think we had a really good time creating it and planning it. So time was on our side, and uh, it, it was adv advantageous knowing the uh, the museum a little bit. You know, I've been a, mu a member since last year when I moved uh, back to Deep River here, and uh, well, I got to tell you, every time I go in that place, there's something new, something new to be seen and and had and found and. Uh, it, it's true that the, the history around here runs deep and um, I'm, I'm glad someone's trying to tell the story and collect it and I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. And uh, yeah, happy, happy to be a small part of this event here today too. It feels very positive, good stuff. Uh, hey. Bob, we like to add that Deep River have a lot of secrets. Like it's not the only one museum we have. I, we like to tell other people that we also have clock museum and maybe that could be some interesting project in the future. So that will be something interesting. Maybe Michael could tell us more about that really interesting building a little history about that. Which building? The, the society? clock museum. The clock museum used to be a church. And then uh, 20 years ago, an ACL retiree from the labs, Alan Simmons, who was uh, always interested in clocks, bought the museum and is running the Canadian Clock Museum. You can easily find it on the internet. It's the only one of its kind, award-winning, and he's doing it all himself. It's just an amazing job. We also have another museum just up the valley, the Schoolhouse Museum, all the history of the the valley in this area from the days of the first settlers, the railways, the logging, all of that. There are also two military museums at Petawawa. So if anyone's interested in museums, we've got plenty of history and interesting things to visit in our neck of the woods. Thanks a lot. Uh, we also have here Phil Compass, who is communication director for CNL. Phil is really excellent guy, you know, he have a lot of secret powers like running down the river. Maybe he can tell us something about that or maybe some kind of interesting things which it's coming from CNL, if it's still not top secret. <laughs> uh, like sending the rocket to the Mars or something like that. Uh, no, no rockets to Mars in our near future, Bob. But thank you. Uh, you're right. Actually, spring has sprung here, so I'm able to get out on the rivers, and it's a it's a great part of the world for outdoor recreation, as everybody knows. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of uh, just to carry on with the things to see and do uh, perspective, uh, CNL is opening a, a storefront visitor center in Deep River in the not too distant future for some of our environmental projects. So. You will be able to check out some of the past, uh, past, present, and future, uh, as well, of course, the new buildings that are opening at the labs. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a, a, a site entrance kind of, uh, not a museum per se, but at least a, a proper entrance facility to greet visitors. So uh, another reason to make your way up to, uh, to our neck of the woods, as Michael says. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys, for being here for that Q&A. And, and if anyone else has any other questions and you're too shy to ask or anything like that tonight, feel free to reach out, especially to Bob. He's such a character. And this wouldn't have been possible without Bob and so many of our other sponsors tonight. Uh, special, special thanks to Sarah Bradshaw. She helped us all get our logistics and lights, camera, action happened because she was ready and wrangling us in. And 
yeah, thank you all so much for being here. I hope you enjoy the rest of National Engineering Month. Uh, any other comments, you guys? Uh, just a quick note, Abra, to uh, tell people about the chapter website uh, where they can reach out to us and uh, email us and so on and so forth. Uh, if you Google PEO Algonquin chapter, uh, you will come to the chapter website and there must be a communication contact us link in there, I'm sure. Yeah, I'd like to uh, send out probably one more message out to any new grads out there that uh, are, are graduated and whether you're in the nuclear industry or not, if you're in the Al Algonquin region, um, definitely reach out to us. And uh, it's very important that, that we kind of build some of those bridges, you know, early on in, in the career and, and get you involved. So just, you know, don't be shy, reach out to us and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely, um, uh, you know, start building that, that career with you. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great night. Thanks a lot, Abra. You have done a great job for helping us for running this event. <laughs> thanks, Abra. <laughs> yeah. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye for now. Oh, that was excellent. Uh, are we still on, maybe?